camera three. Ted Rawson here, folks. Uh, Thursday afternoon, um, downtown Honolulu, Think Tech Studios, with our show Where the Drone Leads, and one of our frequent flyers on this show, uh, a guy who I want to have the audience help us. He's very shy, has a hard time coming up with ideas and opinions, and he's very, very reserved in his expression. I'd like to welcome back Mike Elliott. Can you try to get hey, over that hump this time, I, Mike? I think so. I might be able to. Yeah, right. okay. Yeah. Good enough, man. Good seeing you here. And, uh, Thanks. Kind of the reason we're here is we were actually were together by accident on, um, on, on Saturday. Uh, and how does Saturday have to do with where the drone leads? The drone led us to Hokulea. You were doing some work with uh, a commercial aspect of that. Well, in terms Hawaiian of, News, actually, Hawaiian no. News it was uh, a community service event okay. that we did on, uh, with <laughs> in Hawaiian News Now to and, share um, Hokulea's return with the rest of the world. Okay. And I happened to be in the water in one of the two-man double canoes that was uh, unloading people from the incoming voyaging canoes and taking them to the ramps and such. And I tell you, I've read about helicopter noise in Honolulu a lot. I live in Windward Side, so we have our own version of it out there. But I never experienced the, uh, <clears throat> the skull-numbing effect of turbo machinery noise at 200 feet over your head like I experienced on Saturday. Yeah. Right at the very peak of the ceremony and hopefully arriving, the noise, the helicopter noise, got louder. But there was also you out there getting probably better imagery at making no noise at all. So it just struck me that we have this opportunity in front of us here to do something we never perhaps thought of, and that's use drones to help in reducing the noise signature in Honolulu yeah. caused by helicopters. We could even penetrate into the tourist business in some way, in some intelligent way, and assist in getting the, uh, that noise footprint down as well. Yeah. So, uh, what are your I, thoughts I think, on that? I think too on the uh, another side of that too is this, um, you know, ecological impact. Um, DLNR, that's one of the uh, complaints that they make about not allowing drones in state property and parks, is the uh, impact upon the ecology of the noise factor. But you already have helicopters that are out there doing tours, so you know it's it's a uh, for research uh, that they want to do for ecological research and preservation archaeological research and preservation, uh, low impact, small footprint, low noise, and then um, the ability to collect a lot of data uh, quickly on site is, is really where these things are starting to take into their own. Yeah. And so there's an opportunity here as the next legislative session begins in six months to start having some of these ideas put together in a, in a, in a way that everybody can understand and have a better run through the legislature this year with uh, well thought through, well reasoned, and, and easily understood legislation that deals with uh, gain, gaining access for drones and identifying their purpose, identifying the users and the owners, and coming up with sort of a standard operating principle. I think so. I mean, it's a, it's a simplicity aspect. There's, um, unfortunately, you know, government seems sometimes its purpose is to regulate and to continue to regulate and write bills and without necessarily knowing the full impact of what it is that they're doing until it's already enacted into law, and then, then there are excessive restrictions that take forever to roll back. So a thoughtful approach is to engage the community, um, provide feedback that allows for a system that will work uh, for commercial operations in conjunction with and addressing the concerns that uh, legislators and the community have at large. And that's what we've uh, continued to advocate for. We hope that that is the case because this, again and again, is going to be a multi-billion dollar worldwide industry. And along with the work that you're doing, and then uh, George uh, Purdy, our uh, partner over there on Lanai, working to secure some uh, possible some additional support for the test site, you know, is, is local jobs, local people, bringing that right here to Hawaii. So we want to tie a uh, friendly environment for rules and regulations into a new booming industry early on. You know, we had uh, on, the, on this show the last three weeks, we had uh, Charles Warner, who is the head of the, uh, the deputy at the Department of Emergency mm -hmm. Management in Virginia, mm -hmm. who has a lot to do with how NFPA and the firefighters and the public safety mm -hmm. people are beginning to generate standards and user needs for drones. We had uh, Dean Robinson, who's uh, operating in a private way, but the same approach in Texas. And then we had George Purdy on uh, last week yeah. talking about uh, how we can perhaps use pe drones and people who own drones in sort of an adjunct to the public safety people, but yet outside the curtain, outside the yellow caution line. True. 
but providing a, a form of service. So these ideas are starting to percolate. And I'll say that for the next three weeks, we've got uh, Jim Williams, who used to run the FAA uh, UAS integration, uh, yeah. Gretchen West, who does a lot to do with the emerging uh, coalitions within the industry, uh, trying to get things right. And then we have uh, Jonathan Ruprecht, which will be an interesting conversation. He's all over the regulations area. Yeah. So yeah. we get a lot of opinions coming up right now in the next couple of three weeks that we collectively, all of us who are part of this, need to think about bottling in some way, again, as you, kind of echoing what you said, that is community value, uh, return value to Hawaii, and in several ways, and something that the legislature can grab onto right. and find. So we got to so do that I'll, together. All and definitely. Us. And I, I think part of it is uh, an issue of understanding. Uh, you know, when you have a new technology uh, that's out mm -hmm. there, and I, I hearken back to reading stories about when automobiles were first introduced. <laughs> the red and you, flags. Oh, and you read, you read the, uh, the ridiculous rules that were out there and the stories that were published. And, and it just was a, it was a lack of understanding as to, uh, this is a new technology into a, a, a horse and buggy world. And it was, it was a difficult initial integration, but it was also an understanding issue. Um, I'll let every state legislator know uh, here in the state of Hawaii, if you want a demonstration of this type of capability at the time and place of your choosing, uh, our staff is more than willing to uh, support you on any island, and we will sit down with you and talk with you and show you everything that these things can and cannot do. Uh, the cannot do's are, are usually the things that people are most concerned about, and then when they realize how innocuous that some of this uh, capability really is, then they start to understand the realm of uh, where they're used, how they are used, and uh, not just for hobbyists, but also in commercial operations, uh, like we just talked, you know, fire, uh, police, and other agencies that are looking to use these uh, in, in large part for safety aspect. And we tell people sometimes, if you think about this as a, you know, one life saved kind of aspect, and using this type of technology in different areas. A lot of your fears and concerns kind of go by the wayside because one life saved and a new type of technology that's introduced, you know, may actually sway you and make, uh, make you a believer in what this stuff can do. You know, your idea about a, a collective demonstration of some kind with a lot of hands on is great. In fact, we had the thing that you sponsored a couple of years ago up in uh, Manoa, up at Paradise Park up there, the uh, first gathering of the drone professionals of Hawaii, right? Yeah. And then why not think of October? That's a little bit before the legislative season begins is a good time. And maybe, actually, there's so much going on in October, maybe November is the right time. But, uh, in fact, we had that uh, summit at the state capitol last October. I don't know if it's going to happen again, but we could think of an outdoor version of that. that I, I say we just good. go right out on the lawn on there. On the capitol, the capitol. Right. it should not be a problem. We get plenty of time to plan it right and now. And we, we just do some, you know, some yeah. basic flight, and we show folks really what you know, these things are about and how... Uh, help to alleviate some of their uh, mm -hmm. concerns. In the meantime, we work with the standards people that are as the standards activities building up and have that story complete. I, I believe that uh, a senator or rep from um, Minnesota started some kind of a legislative framework for drones uh, activity in Congress just this week. Have you read about that? Well, a little bit, but there's a, um, what part of that bill uh, that they're discussing is basically allowing, and this is where it, it all falls off, falls apart here, is allowing uh, state, city, county, who knows, homeowners association to draft rules for everything below 200 feet. Well, that doesn't work. And if, uh, if the FAA had to deal with a system where they controlled everything above 18,000 feet, which is where class alpha airspace and commercial airliners fly and everything, and that everything below 18,000 feet fell under the same type of jurisdictional um, mishmash stew, it would never work. You could never get from point A to point B because every time you crossed another boundary, you would have to abide by a different set of rules. You know, to that point, a good thing we could take on, I, I, let me just suggest here to this thing we're going to create now in November for all of our friends in the legislature and any of the public agencies that want to participate, we ought to take on the... the, the Think of the future situation five years from now when there's 500 drones operating in delivery service in Honolulu. Exactly how are we going to do that? Think that through. You know, NASA's got the uh, UTM program, but that may or may not be what's, it may not be, may not be certifiable at the end of the day. It hasn't gotten to that point yet. So if we took on and thought of ourselves, this larger group we represent, how would we handle high drone traffic 
in Hawaii, in, in Honolulu, for that matter, and, and have that kind of a thought process on the table and start opening the door. Right. So the, the testing that's going mm -hmm. on, and once again, coming back to the UAS test site, you know, over on Lanai, uh, and, you know, George working very hard with the folks at the University of Alaska to get some of these first few events, uh, you know, up and running and with the University of Hawaii. There's an opportunity to test those types of technologies and those fail-safes associated with those technologies to turn these into proven systems. The, the state's already very interested in allowing driverless cars on the it's road the with, thing, with no, yeah. Yeah. I don't hear anybody crying or complaining or any concerns at all about driverless cars, uh, which I think the, the uh, incidents or the, uh, you know, where an incident or accident could occur and actually kill somebody. By the way, somebody. I want to compliment you. You seem to have gotten over your shyness and your yeah. unwillingness to bring up controversial ideas. But, you know, those, those kind of gone away. It's a show. It's, a, it's, it's you, Ted. Yeah. Uh, but those, those kind of ideas, uh, you know, kind of, oh, sure, yeah, driverless cars, no problem, um, yeah. without a second thought. And so if you're willing to accept those types of technologies where you're putting, you know, uh, a 4,000-pound vehicle on the road traveling at 65 miles an hour with nobody at the wheel, uh, on H1 or any back road here in Hawaii, then, you know, that's not that far a leap to accept something that's in the air that does have a user interface and control. But at some point in the future, too, like you're talking about with delivery, uh, will be a, a, an autonomous type of system. It'll fly from point A to point B, deliver the product and return. You so need pizza on uh, Super Bowl Sunday? Well, guess what? You know, Domino's is delivering. You know, that's so what they're working on. Outlined, outlined the problem statement for the, the, the high level of this activity in November. But let's take a look at what you brought here to the table because yeah. people also probably aren't familiar with how fast the technology is emerging. And what you've got here is a, is a really interesting miniature system, yeah. Mike. So this is a, a, a DJI Mavic. Uh, put some, uh, one of the skins that they have on there. You can actually just wrap it normally. That's come how you in a carry it. Around. That isn't how you fly it, right? No, no. Okay. So it folds up and it fits in a small bag. Uh, we brought this out for the demonstration we did for the Philippine and Indonesian delegation at the, uh, uh, over Diamond Head crater the other day uh, for the HADR uh, discussion that we had. And we're basically trying to show them that you know, you can have some low-cost, lightweight, um, semi-disposable, and I say semi-disposable because of cost, you know, if something were to happen, uh, technology that can actually provide you uh, some really great uh, data and information. Uh, so what you have here is the drone itself with, um, let me put it back here, there we go, we can see that better. Um, rated at about 27 minute flight time, range, range out of, it said, you know, about four miles, but, you know, right now you're still limited line of sight. But what that really means is you've got good signal. So you got radio comms out to four miles. Good, yeah, you'll have good control signal. And you have a live video feed back to you. Back you can, to your cell phone, right. I might add. Right? So it runs, uh, it'll basically. You can take this apart. The cell phone comes yeah, out. You yeah. take your phone back, but you run an app on the phone itself. You have a display up here that'll have information on it also. And you have the control features uh, that are right here. So it's uh, extremely portable. Uh, what we were discussing was the ability to uh, empower people in local communities to be first responders in natural Amen. disaster incidents. So if you, in countries like Indonesia and Philippines, if they had a budget to distribute technology uh, throughout the provinces in various remote locations, work to train people to be those first responders in How the community. How about in Hawaii? How about in Waimanalo? Can we do it right here? Yeah. Yeah that they could actually provide that information back to um, you know, larger uh, entities within the government or when international agencies begin to show up, that they've already collected data. Uh, they could map areas and provide that. Here you go, here's my memory card. I, I made a map the other day for you. I well, knew what, you were coming. What's um, intriguing yeah. to me about this, and we'll take a break and come back to this after a bit, but uh, what's really intriguing to me here is how miniaturized these systems are getting and how simple they're getting. So the, the fear factor that many people have of getting into something with a lot of switches on it and a lot of gains to adjust and such, it's gone. Yeah. Well, we had so, that Philippine general, uh, you know, he yeah. wanted to fly and so he flew this and, you know, letting him fly there for a little bit and just kind of watching over him and keeping a close eye, make sure he was good. And then he wanted to land it. So we sat there and I just uh, talked to him. He realized how quickly, how forgiving the controls were. And he landed it within probably about six, eight inches of where I told him to put it uh, with no problem. And he was very surprised uh, at how forgiving and easy the technology was. So for him to do that first time uh, kind of, helped him realize that maybe this is something that is simple and easy to learn. So now it's time to start taking that to our own communities here. Let's talk about that when we get back from our break. Sure. Sounds good.
Aloha. My name is Raya Salter, and I'm the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live at from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to politicians to regulators to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at 1 o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. We're back, folks. Ted Rawson here, and our guest, Mike Elliott. Mike, welcome on board again. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Yeah. And, and your little friend here. We're just talking before the break about how straightforward and easy to operate, cell phone simple, you might say. Uh, these are becoming, in fact, you might think of this drone you've got here, the uh, DJI Mavic, as a cell phone app. It's got a cell phone bolted to it, yeah. and it's the cell phone tells it what to do. And I suspect the cell phone receives the information down from the Mavic. It does. Gives you some information. It does. And you can, it actually downloads a cache of some of this video and photo you shot so that you have it instantly available to share out. So you could send a low res uh, um, quality photo or video to somebody if, as long as you had cell connectivity at some point. Uh, these types of systems, too, are using in, in disaster relief well, or actually, actually putting some stuff airborne, too. One of our so, UH researchers yeah. is using this exact piece of equipment to do. Uh, inshore uh, coral and uh, sand bottom monitoring yeah. out in Monolu Bay. So there's, it's starting to happen. These things are getting so competent and so capable and affordable. You can now see your way through to get them in a lot of people's hands because they're more trustworthy in the sense of the people's confidence mm -hmm. to use them. Which then leads to what we were saying before the break about how to get a, a staff of these business capability out there in the citizens' hands here in other countries to generate information when anything has to, has to be observed, yeah. a natural disaster, a fire, or something like that. And as long as we could have some standard that the people perform to and have some means by which the information is tagged for its time and date or its latency or that mm -hmm. sort of thing and provide it across the barrier to where the professional first responders, the professional public safety people are, and have an interface that would connect in. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Well, I, nothing. And I think uh, you had some folks on just earlier yeah. when I first came in from the National Disaster Preparedness Training Center. Got it right the first time. There uh, you go. That's NDPTC. the first time anybody has ever and, pronounced uh, <laughs> NDPTC correctly. <laughs> but you know, this some of what they're trying to work on, uh, you know, here but also overseas is, like I said, this this concept of empowerment of local communities with technology. Um, a lot of countries skip landlines in developing countries around the world. So you'll go to a lot of places overseas and try to find a landline phone or a, a you know, phone on a street corner, good luck. You know, they just went straight to cell phones because that was really the, the first mass introduction to uh, phone technology. So they skipped a generation. You can see some of that also possibly with uh, this type of technology in um, the support of uh, disaster relief um, and search and rescue humanitarian aid type situations where um, for the military when we show up in an international incident support with the Marine Corps taking the lead here with Mar 4 pack in the Pacific, we spend time setting ourselves up so that we have a place to eat, a place to sleep, we can refuel, and where are we storing everything before we distribute it out? That's a period of days. It's a heavy footprint, too. It's a big footprint. It's a period of days before we're actually in mass uh, supporting the community that's affected. So, you know, initial first responders at a lower level in the communities with low cost systems could actually provide a very valuable asset when the first responders do show up that they have information that they can hand over. I map this out. This is, this, here's some photos of the, uh, um, you know, the fuel facility that's damaged, the dam is broken, you know, the roads are washed out. And so they have this information that they can act on instantly. Uh, satellites don't get retasked right away either like they do in the movies. 30 days. Yeah, <laughs> it takes time and that's money also. 
So plus it's a one meter resolution. Yeah, on some of them, yeah. Um, so that's an issue too. So they don't get tasked right away to instantly support, you know, within they, hours. There's competition for their tasking too. Yeah, they face yeah. that. Yeah, true. And they have priority in who pays yeah. and everything, yeah. So, and then also you have uh, other large UAV assets and stuff, but once again, they have to be brought to bear. They have to have a place to take off and land from, a mission to fly, what are they collecting? Um, so, you know, it's, there's, there's an intermediary, intermediary ground here that allows maybe a local community to begin looking for lost people, find lost livestock. Livestock is life. Boats uh, in, you know, uh, water-borne communities and stuff, boats are life. You live or die by the fact that you can fish or that you can tra you know, transport family to a hospital because the only way to get there is by boat. Um, being able to rebuild your home by collecting materials that were blown away or washed away uh, you know, and finding where this stuff is at. It, you know, any way to expedite that, you know, and this is maybe one way that that could begin to happen in, like, and, Indonesia, and, and, and Philippines. It'd be cool to really get to start right here. Again, there's, yeah. I mean, all of our, all of our island <clears throat> communities around the periphery, uh, Haulu, Haula, uh, Waimanalo, uh, Kailua to a certain extent, are, yeah. they're all one way in, one way out. And if we ever lose one of those roads, yeah. uh, which we do from time to time, uh, we get some period of time before that transportation uh, channel is going to be right. fixed. So if we took the fact that these systems are becoming very simple and are becoming a higher trust level as a result and found a way to gather together the people who want to participate and get them to a common level of training and uh, appreciation of their role and the safety aspects, give them a hunter's safety card equivalent, thanks George Purdy for that idea, and then operate them once a month in an exercise or once every two months, something like that, to keep things fresh, figure out how we're going to distribute information, who's going to receive it, and how it's going to be uh, uh, archived and such. Uh, well, you have, you have an organization that kind of does something like that now. It's called the Civil Air Patrol. All right, so the Civil Air Patrol assists, can assist, and has been called on, um, on the mainland and other places to uh, provide additional aircraft and looking for downed aircraft. Uh, ground personnel to support that, but they're not a government agency or entity at all, but they are trained in that process and are volunteer, you know, pilots that work for the Civil Air Patrol. So they, in, in some aspect, they've kind of, you know, pioneered a way to, to do that and interact with uh, uh, federal and local authorities, you know, in, in, an, in an incident that has occurred. And here in Hawaii, we have the CERT teams, which are kind of a national standard, and we have the HHARP, the Hawaii Hazardous Awareness Response Teams. Mm -hmm. And so there's a budding organization in very strong and certain communities like Monoa, uh, where the, the power is there, the interest is there, and the ability to provide senior leadership is there. Mm -hmm. But he's got to do it. In fact, Manoa, uh, Helen Nakano up in Manoa, uh, has asked for that kind of support to Manoa. So I think it's reasonable to extend this invitation to the larger network of uh, UAS affili affiliates here in Hawaii, and at least on Oahu, and um, come up with a couple of options of how we might go, how we might do this. Definitely. Uh, and you know, similar, the amateur radio. Yeah. The, uh, 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 ARRL was created for this reason 150 years ago. Yeah. So, you know, on, on this thought process in line right here, too, the other thing that uh, you've got to consider, you know, when, the, when you're in the military, there's all these uh, great ships and airplanes and weapons you wish you had, you know, oh, they're <laughs> developing this. But if something happens, you fight with the force you have. You fight with the people that you have, the training that you've done, the ships, aircraft, uh, ground personnel. That's all you got. So, you know, if an incident were to occur tomorrow, say, God forbid, there's a, you know, a, um, a tsunami that washes ashore somewhere here in Hawaii, well, we can't wish for what we would like to have in the future. We've got to go with what we have now. So, you know, in some degree, expediting these programs and getting off a of top dead center and stop talking about it and start doing it to make sure that it is available as a resource is really where we need to go because we've had this discussion for quite some time uh, you know over the course of the past couple of years and slow progress has been made but we really need to get off top dead center and turn let's it into that. something let's, that's actionable let's take that to the uh, to the november time period as a part of the demonstrated capability we can provide to the legislature to give them both the understanding and the, the touch and feel aspects of it also the real value that comes from this kind of a thing in a citizen environment 
And I'll go back to the very beginning of the show. I also like to think of the fact that the noise footprint in Honolulu will come down if we can start displacing uh, manned helicopters with UAVs for the various reasons we can. And as to the point you made, I think our, our wildlife and forests and fauna in the deep valleys would be very happy to have less helicopter traffic going in and yeah. disturbing them. So I mean, we low can, impact, used yeah, by DLNR and other agencies, so uh, USGS. Uh, for lots know, of reasons, are, yeah. we're kind of turning the corner here, it seems, and I think we have the, uh, the obligation to go push that around the corner and get a good story in front of the legislature in November at the legis on the Capitol grounds with a multi-faceted, hands-on demonstration of petting zoo, so to speak, for Not the sure. future of UAS. Yeah. Mike, we'll do it. Glad to do and it. We'll keep talking about it, though, because this show no, is all about talk. Well, we're going to so make it happen. Okay. Let's make all it right. happen. Mike, right, Mike Elliott, thanks for coming on again. Thanks. Aloha. Thanks.